Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us and thank you for attending. And thank you to the Maine Historical Society for hosting this event and also for helping sponsor my research um, that made my book possible. MHS is an incredibly important institution for preserving and interpreting Maine's history, as I'm sure all of you know, and their financial commitment to New England Regional Fellowship Consortium enables scholars like me to come to Portland to use their rich collections of records and artifacts. I'd like to begin this discussion tonight in the same way that I begin my book, by talking about enslaved African-American woman, Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley was stolen from her family in Senegambia, and in 1761, European slave traders transported her to Boston, Massachusetts to be sold. She was about seven years old at the time. The Wheatley family treated her far better than almost all slaves in the 18th century, and she received a thorough education, but her writings indicate that she still longed for freedom. Wheatley began writing poetry around 1765, and it was often religious in content. Church records indicate that Phyllis, quote, servant of Mr. Wheatley, was baptized by the Reverend Samuel Cooper on August 18, 1771, at the Old South Meeting House in Boston. Her baptism occurred less than three years before that meeting house was used for the infamous meeting uh, involving the Boston Tea Party. She continued to attend this church on a regular basis. And in 1773, she traveled to England and some of her poetry was published in London as a book titled Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. The fact that we have this engraving of her likeness is evidence that her experience of enslavement was exceptional. We don't have images uh, of the vast majority of enslaved people, right? This is atypical. Wheatley was in the late 18th century and still remains to this day the most famous Black Christian from the colonial era. Despite her uniqueness uh, in terms of her experiences and accomplishments, However, Phyllis Wheatley was metaphorically just the tip of the iceberg in terms of African-American participation and affiliation with predominantly white churches in New England. Thousands of African-Americans and hundreds of indigenous people participated in and affiliated with predominantly white churches in New England during the 18th century and early 19th century. However, the history of these churches and our perspective of them has been whitewashed. Most Americans think of colonial churches as being entirely white organizations. Historians have known about Phyllis Wheatley and a few other black church members, but they're usually treated as outliers in the narrative of American religious history. Yet, most New Englanders worshiped and experienced formal religion in interracial contexts in the 18th century and into the early 19th century before churches gradually separated along racial lines. New England churches, especially congregational and Anglican churches were commonly interracial. Almost wherever there were people of color in New England, they participated in the central institutions of these communities. And this fact alters how we think about the colonial North. As we'll explain, these churches were interracial but not integrated. These churches implicitly and sometimes explicitly justified slavery and the dispossession of Indians from their land. But people of color participated in these churches in ways that was not passive. They actively sought to remake colonial Christianity and to make these churches serve their own interests. So in making these points, I'm gonna focus on three interrelated questions. In what ways and to what extent did African-Americans and Native Americans participate in 18th century and 19th century churches? What did participation in these churches mean for African-Americans and Native Americans? When and why did their participation in mostly white churches decline or end? And what effects did that have on society more broadly? So you can track uh, the direction I'm going um, with, with these sort of Organize, organizational questions. Although my book covers Pennsylvania, New York, 
New Jersey, uh, as well as New England, and covers a wide variety of Northern Protestant denominations. In the talk today, I'm gonna to focus particularly on New England and Congregational uh, and Anglican Episcopalian churches. I usually use the term Anglican, but these are um, Church of England parishes that following the American Revolution uh, form the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America. So they're Anglican in the colonial era and they become Episcopalian after the American Revolution. So looking in first, what ways uh, and to what extent did African-Americans and Native Americans participate in 18th century and 19th century churches? Well, interracial worship was more common in New England churches than has been generally assumed by historians. Between 1730 and 1790, before separate black churches were formed in New England, African-American men, women, and children regularly connected to, participated in predominantly white congregational Anglican churches. Moreover, Pequot, Narragansett, Mohican, Wampanoag, Shinnecock, and other indigenous people participated in the churches of Southern New England in substantial numbers during the 1730s and 1740s, and occasionally in later decades. They participated primarily uh, in the same ways that most other people in the society participated with these churches. They attended services where they sang, prayed, listened to sermons. They received religious education in catechism classes. They were baptized and they had their children baptized. African-Americans and Native Americans became halfway members, full members and communicants. They were married by ministers. They were buried uh, in church burial grounds. The reason I know this and the reason I can say the extent to which African-Americans participated was because of the church records from many, many congregations, um, more than 400 for the whole North. The church records, like the page on display here, include racial notations. Uh, the racial notations are, are clearly problematic uh, and they are related to the oppression that these people faced. But the byproduct of, of really the racism in the church records is that I'm able to count and quantify uh, and track the actions of many African-Americans and Native Americans who don't appear elsewhere um, very often in historical records. So for example, the sheet that you see on this slide is from uh, the Congregational Church uh, in Abington, Massachusetts. And at the very bottom of this page, the text reads, December 26th, my man, Tony, made a confession of his formal evil and sinful life and declared how God had met him and was baptized. So in this case, an enslaved man owned by the church's congregational minister made a profession, made a confession, and was publicly baptized. In a similar way, we see part of a list of baptisms that uh, was recorded at the Old South Meeting House in Boston in 1741. Uh, near the top of this line, we see Maria, who is uh, a servant to Mrs. Hannah Fairweather. Servants is, is usually an um, indicator of, of servitude, um, uh, of enslavement, not simply a hired servant in, the, in this context. Uh, down at the bottom, we see Phyllis, Indian servant to Mr. Timothy Prott and Peter, her son, to indigenous people baptized. Um, Indian people sometimes were enslaved in the 18th century, um, but in, given what we know from other records, um, Phyllis could have been um, a hired servant, someone in, in bondage for, for debt or for a limited term of, of indentured servitude or possibly a lifelong slave. So these records give us an insight. And when we look at records from lots and lots of churches and keep track of where African-Americans and Native Americans appear in the records, then we can get a fuller picture of how they're participating, uh, what types of churches they're participating in, and how does that participation change over time? Let me just briefly make a quick plug for this website. Uh, this is part of the Congregational Library and Archives website, their New England Hidden Histories Project. A lot of the church records, the images of the church records, church records that you're seeing in this talk today came from this website. 
This is a digitization and transcription project. And they're, they're finding and preserving and protecting colonial era church records from across New England and digitizing them and making them more widely available. And the Maine Historical Society is a partner with this project. So some of the uh, collections from Maine Historical uh, are a part of this online resource. This map shows the locations of Anglican and congregational churches that baptized or admitted multiple African Americans or Native Americans during the 1730s and 40s. This map shows about 120 congregations across New England. And keep in mind that in this time period, not all of New England is settled by Europeans. Um, the settlement pattern, patterns obviously are, are more along the coasts than along the interior. Um, but settlement is beginning to move further into the interiors and along the riverways. Particularly to this talk, I want to bring attention to the list there that I've included of some of the churches in Maine uh, that I looked at um, when I researched at Maine Historical, where I found African Americans. <clears throat> there are other churches where I found only one, um, or maybe um, some cases where it wasn't exactly clear whether they were an African American or not, and those churches were not included on this map. Um, but here we see that there were churches in uh, Berwick, Portland, Scarsborough, Wells, Tittery that included multiple African American baptisms or members during the 1730s and 40s. Some congregational churches in New England only baptized one or two Black people in the course of a decade. Other congregations baptized 10 or more uh, in a single year. I think it's important to note that even small numbers of baptisms are significant in many cases. In some New England towns, there were very few Black residents. So a couple of African Americans being baptized actually represented a high proportion of the Black residents of any given town, especially in the earlier 18th century. Uh, and there's also a sense that um, we need to understand that even if there's few people participating in the church, the, the numbers themselves don't tell us whether or not it was significant to those who participated. Even though they might have been small in number, the participation of a few African Americans in a church uh, was likely significant to those who took those rituals seriously. For a little bit more context, this is a list of servants for life, right, slaves, um, according to a 1771 tax valuation list. These numbers are probably low, they're probably undercounting. Uh, the, there's an incentive to not disclose the presence of slaves because this was for the purposes of taxing them. And uh, Port, Portland um, is not on this map. So 1771, we can, we can say the bare minimum, uh, but probably a lot more than 112 enslaved people in uh, these parts of Maine. There are more than 860 African Americans in Maine in the year 1800. Uh, and more than 1,300 uh, by the year 1840. So again, in some of these towns where there's only a few Black residents, a couple of them participating in the church uh, should be considered significant. This table shows you total baptisms that occurred in 12 of Boston's oldest churches, Congregational and Anglican. On the left side of the table shows you baptisms that happened between 1730 and 1749. And so in that period, there's 254 clearly identifiable African-American baptisms in these 12 Boston churches. That's an average of about 12 a year, um, or 2.69% of the total number of baptisms that happened at these 12 churches during that period. The right side it shows you the period of 1750 to 1763. That's a shorter time period. Um, but during that shorter time period, 143 African Americans were baptized at these 12 Boston churches, and that is a um, percentage of 2.79% of the total number of baptisms. Many factors influenced affiliation rates as they changed over time. 
that African Americans continued to participate in congregational churches across New England during the rest of the 18th century and in some places into the 19th century. So for the, the earlier period, 1730s and 1740s, I already mentioned I found 120 churches. In the period of 1750 to 1763, I've identified about 100 congregations in that shorter amount of time that included multiple identifiable Black baptisms or, or members. During the period that stretched from 1764 to 1790, uh, when there's quite a bit of disruption during the Revolutionary War, I identified 75 congregational churches that baptized or admitted multiple Black people uh, during those eras. And certainly the period of the revolution um, dramatically changes the religious landscape of New England. And also in the late 18th century, see a lot more competition, uh, Baptists, Methodists, uh, and other churches sort of competing for adherence, uh, competing for African-American adherence in New England. Several of Connecticut's churches, particularly those near Mohegan and Pequot land reserves, had high numbers of Indian participants in addition to some Black people. Groton, Stonington, New London, Lebanon, Old Lyme, Hebron, Norwich, Connecticut, were places where Indians were most active in churches during the 1730s and 40s. The first church of New London, Connecticut, baptized Indian people ranging from leading Mohicans to the most marginalized Indian servants. During the 1730s and 1740s, the Congregational Church in New London baptized at least 16 Native Americans. Nine were adults and seven were children, although the racial notations are, are much more haphazard, so it was probably more than that. The Mohican sachem, Benjamin Uncas II, and several of his family members publicly affiliated and joined the New London Congregational Church and were baptized there during the mid 18th century. And this image uh, shows you the uh, Uncas Monument and the Royal Mohican Burial Grounds where some um, of those um, church members were eventually buried. Anglican churches were even more consistent in baptizing and admitting to communion African-Americans. Uh, they more consistently baptize African-Americans than most congregational churches, and oftentimes in higher numbers. This map shows uh, Anglican churches in the 1760s and early 1770s, stretching from Christ Church in Philadelphia at the bottom of this map, all the way up to Queen's Chapel in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, across the region, especially in colonial capitals and port cities, Anglican churches welcomed African Americans into their congregations and baptized them in substantial numbers. St. Paul's Church in Portland, Maine, opened their building on June 6th, 1765. The next day, on June 7th, 1765, two enslaved African Americans were baptized, Moses and Silva. Silva was the property of the Anglican minister, the Reverend J. Bushwell. In 1767, Elizabeth and another enslaved woman was baptized at St. Paul's. And in 1769 and 1770, Dina and Boston, uh, more enslaved people were baptized at the Church of England Parish in Portland, Maine. And this church uh, burned down um, in 1775 um, when the British attacked. This is Trinity Church, Newport, Newport, Rhode Island. This church had the highest number of black baptisms and congregants of any church in Newport, Rhode Island. During the 1760s and 1770s, more black people were baptized here at this church than at all of the rest of Newport's churches combined. All the, there had two congregational, uh, at least three Baptist, Moravian, and um, Friends meeting house, but this Anglican church baptized more than all those other congregations combined. 51 African Americans were baptized here between 1764 and 1776. At least 21 of them were adults who were professing the faith when they were baptized, uh, and some were free. Throughout the colonial era, 
Protestant ministers routinely owned enslaved people. And Protestant ministers participated in their commodification and asserted the procession of people in church records with phrases such as my servant or my slave. This uh, complicity is exhibited in the York, Maine First Parish records. The first parish congregational church, uh, the first parish of the Congregational Church of York, Maine, raised 120 pounds in the mid 1730s to purchase a slave for the parish and for the use of Reverend Samuel Moody. A few years later, after the purchase of an enslaved man, uh, his, his name was Andrew, Reverend Moody was not satisfied with the labor or the disposition of this enslaved man, and the parish voted to sell him. The parish voted, quote, to dispose and make sale of the man named Andrew belonging to the said parish at the best advantage. Not only did ministers and churches use the labor of enslaved people, but they also sometimes sought a financial advantage in selling them. White Christians placed severe limits on the participation of African Americans and Native Americans in these churches, and white Christians displayed prejudice against Indians and Blacks. These churches usually did not allow Black and Indian people to vote in church affairs or to hold leadership positions in the churches. Along with segregated seating by status and sometimes segregated seating by gender and age, Predominantly white churches usually required black and indigenous people to occupy segregated seating in a portion of the galleries or the balconies or at the back um, least desirable seats on the ground floor during worship services. No denominations until the late 18th century ordained African Americans. So what's striking is that African Americans and Native Americans participated in these churches despite the limitations and the marginalization that they experienced in the churches. If the churches helped justify slavery and helped justify, sometimes outright took Indian lands, uh, but no, nevertheless, African-Americans and Native Americans participated in some of these churches. So the question that has to be raised is why? Um, the short answer is that they did so for a variety of reasons and it's complex. Um, motivations were mixed there are both material and spiritual reasons encouraging some, but not all, some African Americans and Native Americans to participate in these predominantly white churches, despite restrictions and prejudices. Church services were an opportunity to see other enslaved friends and family members dispersed across towns. Blacks and Indians alike sought the educational opportunities that these churches provided. Church membership conferred a degree of social status. Christianity could provide a positive identity for enslaved people. Indigenous people sometimes sought the help of sympathetic ministers as they dealt with legal disputes with other colonists. It's clear that they participated in so many congregations that their religious practices must be taken seriously. And so let's go through a few of those motivations. Access to education, without a doubt, is clearly a motivating factor for many of the people who participated in these churches. At the Second Congregational Church of Newport, Rhode Island, pictured here, the Reverend Ezra Stiles baptized, married, and admitted to communion numerous Black people, um, including one he owned and, and a woman named Phyllis who was owned by the governor and who was married to uh, another church member. Stiles held weekly catechism classes. And at these classes, black children almost always attended his classes with white children, learning how to read, learning uh, about religion. Trinity Church, which I've already mentioned, operated a charity school specifically for educating black children in the 18th century. It was funded by the Bray Associates of London. In 1771, the school run, a charity school run by this church enrolled 30 black children who were taught reading, writing, sewing, and other skills. But that ability to 
access literacy, learning how to write even, uh, was something that enslaved people sought after and valued. In the spring of 1774, there were 38 students at this charity school. The last names of the masters who allowed enslaved children to attend this school match the last names of many of the Black people who were baptized at Trinity Church. So there seems to be a pretty strong correlation between accessing education and accessing uh, sacraments in this church. Churches were also means of obtaining other practical benefits as well. In 1764, the vestry of Trinity Newport voted to have, quote, the church wardens hire a room for Marcador, formerly a slave of Nathan K. Esquire, deceased, set him free and pay his rent for one year. This enslaved man was a estate bequest. He was given to the church, but the church decided in this case to um, free the man instead of using his labor uh, or selling him. And they, they found a place for him to live for the year. This sort of generosity was very uncommon, but black people knew that church affiliation could bring tangible benefits, such as an education, access to white patronage, place to socialize, Christ Church and King's Chapel in Boston distributed some of their poor relief funds to free African-Americans in the middle decades of the 18th century. Many black and Indian people affiliated with white churches, moreover, because pastors and congregants actively ministered to them in times when they were searching for spiritual meaning for their many worldly ills. Sarah Osborne is a really good example of that in Newport, Rhode Island. Catherine Breckis has a great book about Sarah Osborne. Although their options were severely limited and restricted by the confines of slavery and colonialism, some Black Indian people seem to find spiritual fulfillment in these churches. Phyllis Wheatley, in her private correspondence to another enslaved woman, Obar Tanner, talked about, uh, in private, her religious beliefs. And in one case, when she had been sick, Phyllis Wheatley wrote, that she was comforted, quote, by him who declared from heaven that his strength was made perfect in weakness, end quote. In a 1773 letter to Englishman John Thornton, Phyllis Wheatley commented that God was no respecter of persons, being the maker of all. God, she wrote, quote, therefore disdains not to be called the father of humble Africans and Indians. Though despised on earth on account of our color, we have this consolation. Cuffey and Anna Wright were members of the Middleborough Congregational Church in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Cuffey Wright joined in 1773, and this testimony survived in the church records, so we can get a sense of his words and, and the reasons that he expressed for wanting to join the church. Wright said that, quote, Christ is precious to my soul. When I'm about my calling and business, I have find many passages of scripture that comfort my soul, and my mind has been comforted with things of the nether world. Sin is grief to me, Christ is precious to my soul. He continued, I find many passages of scripture that comfort my soul. Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Statements like these were typical of many Christian professions from the era. Cuffey eventually gains his freedom uh, and a short time after takes the last name Wright and marries a woman named Anna. Anna joined the church in 1796. Anna expressed gratitude that she was, quote, born and brought up in the land of gospel light and my parents gave me to God in baptism. But she lamented how she had long neglected to build her faith upon this good foundation. Anna was concerned about her soul, and she eventually found relief and from her sense of sinfulness and described how, quote, the Lord in mercy has, I hope, appeared to me. African Americans further found in the Christianity of congregational churches a Christianity that they could change and adapt into an anti-slavery Christianity. These churches were not anti-slavery for the most part until some began to adopt those anti-slavery principles during the Revolutionary Era. But African Americans often, uh, often articulated anti slavery Christian critiques before white Christians adopted anti slavery opinions. So, this is a petition to end slavery from enslaved African Americans in Massachusetts from 1774. And many of this 
freedom petitions uh, appealed to Christianity as well as Republican ideas um, of, of liberty and freedom in calling for an end to slavery. So finally, lastly, let me let me turn more briefly to uh, when and why African Americans, Native American participation in mostly white churches declined and ended, and what the effect that had on the rest of society. Native Americans began forming separate churches in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Long Island about four decades before Northern African Americans formed their own churches. And uh, one of the leaders who helped form separate Native American churches is Reverend Sansom Alcombe, uh, who was born in 1723 in Connecticut and eventually is ordained as the first Native American Presbyterian minister. He led separate Native American churches in um, Montucket on Long Island uh, and among Pequot and Mohican in Connecticut and also took trips to upstate New York. Many Narragansetts affiliated with Reverend Joseph Parks Congregational Church in Westerly, Rhode Island in the 1740s, but they formed and organized their own congregation in the 1750s. One of the Narragansett men who participated in Reverend Parks Church was Samuel Niles, but Parks Church rebuked Samuel Niles for exhorting or preaching. Following this rebuke, most of the Narragansetts left Parks Church. The Narragansetts ordained Samuel Niles as their own minister, and Niles led this independent Narragansett church for many decades. As slavery gradually ended in the North, Black men and women formed dozens of separate Black churches after 1790, especially uh, in Northern cities. Churches uh, started and spread faster in New York and Philadelphia, but eventually they were formed in many New England cities as well. The creation of many separate churches was a result of discrimination. AME Zion Bishop John Moore wrote that race, race prejudice and prescriptions caused the New York City Methodists to worship separately starting in 1796. But a religious conviction also was a powerful motivation for the creation of separate black churches. The leaders of Philadelphia's St. Thomas Episcopal Church stated in 1810 that the primary cause and motivation behind establishing their church was, quote, for the purpose of advancing our friends in a true knowledge of God, of true religion, and of the ways and means to restore our long lost race to the dignity of men and of Christians, end quote. Essentially, these Black church leaders are saying that a separate Black church uh, can restore dignity and can be more effective in evangelizing and spreading Christianity than interracial churches. This is a picture, of course, of the African Meeting House in Boston, uh, the first African American church in that city. And this uh, is the first African American church building in Portland. <clears throat> Even as many African Americans left predominantly white churches to form separate churches, there was still a significant number of African Americans who, in the eight the 1790s to 18 teens remained in predominantly white churches. So there's a period of time where African American churches are developing and spreading, but also African Americans are joining predominantly white churches. And so Black Christianity is sort of growing together in these separate spaces before a rather stark, a stark drop off uh, in interracial churches after 1820. So take, for example, the second church in Kittery, Maine, which was originally organized in 1721. In 1747 and 1748, the Second Church of Kittery admitted to communion Black people named Combo and Hannah. Another Black woman named Dina became a member of this church in 1765. But then there's a several decade break where there aren't more African Americans admitted as full members. Some are baptized, but no more full members. Then in 1815, we have several more African-Americans join this predominantly white church. John and Margaret Hanscott, who are identified in the record as, quote, people of color, were baptized and admitted, as well as uh, Violet March. Um, all, so these three more African-Americans joined in 1815 as part of this continued growth of African-Americans joining predominantly white churches in the 19th century. <clears throat> 
In the case of Portland, uh, after protesting against segregation within the church in 1826, African-American members left the Second Congregational Church of Portland, withdrew and joined with other African-Americans to form the Abyssinian Congregational Church. Increasingly in the period of 1820 to 1850, Northern whites expressed anti-Black and anti-Indian sentiment, instigated race riots, and promoted segregation in churches, schools, public transportation, work, and neighborhoods. One commentator in 1815 noted that there is not one trade in New York in which a colored inhabitant are allowed to work with whites. That was a quotation. Urban race riots targeting black churches, upwardly mobile African-Americans and abolitionists became common. These riots happened in Providence, Rhode Island in 1824 and 1831, in New York City in 1834, in Hartford, Connecticut, 1835, and elsewhere. This image shows you a white mob attacking African-American school. This is a school for colored girls, is what the title says. And the caption below notes that these sort of attacks on schools, attacks on African-American education happened in Canterbury, Connecticut, Canaan, New Hampshire, and in Ohio. <clears throat> Discrimination in churches was one reason why Black and Indian people left. As Black people chose to withdraw or were ejected from Northern predominantly white churches, these white churches essentially gave moral sanction to segregation as churches increasingly functioned as yet another segregated space in the North. And so African-Americans withdrew, they formed their own churches where they could have equality and self-determination but they also critiqued white Northern churches and society. And so I wanna end with just briefly these two points about uh, two fascinating religious leaders from the 1830s who were radical critics of Northern white Christianity, William Apis and David Walker. William Apis was a Pequot Indian from Connecticut. He was born in 1798 and was indentured as a child. He marked March 13, 1813 as the day he converted, and he's eventually ordained as a Methodist minister. David Walker was born free in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1785, and his firsthand knowledge of Southern slavery deeply influenced his writings. In 1826, he moved to Boston, Massachusetts and opened up a clothing store. By the fall of 1829, he had written The Appeal, which you see the title page up there. Both Walker and Apis critiqued white Americans as, quote, pretended Christians. Walker argued that white professors of Christianity were actually not Christians because their actions towards Black people and Native American people were contrary to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Walker asked, quote, can anything be a greater mockery of religion than the way in which it is conducted by the Americans? Walker made sharp distinction between white pretended Christians and the Christianity taught to him and other African-Americans by Jesus, the person he said was uh, the true master. By arguing that black and Indians possessed true Christianity, they established that uh, as established by Jesus and his disciples, Walker and Apis contended that it was white Americans who needed conversion. They said white Americans needed to convert to the peaceful religion of Jesus. And if they did, their discrimination against African Americans and Native Americans would cease. So slavery and racism were not simply Southern institutions. They were national ones. New Englanders and Northern churches have a history of slavery, racism, and land dispossession that we all need to grapple with. And I hope that this book makes a contribution to grappling with this history and its legacies for the sake of our current society and for future generations. Thank you, uh, Richard. Once again, everyone, um, we are here this evening uh, with Richard Bowles, who is the author of Dividing the Faith. Um, and I have put the link in the chat to where you can purchase the book through Maine Historical Society Museum Store if you're interested.
Uh, we now have time uh, for a few questions. I want to start us off, Richard, by asking, can you explain a little bit more about how you utilized the collections at Maine Historical Society for your research? Yeah, certainly. Um, the, the church records that I examined there were really um, fruitful for determining where uh, and when African Americans participated in, in Maine's churches. So coming into the library um, at the time, it was uh, coming to access church records, uh, original, and in some cases, transcriptions that were not available anywhere else. That these valuable uh, colonial records um, are stored and protected there. And so really the only way to find out and to look through the records was, was to come um, and, and use them in the library. And it was to read through the lists of baptisms, members, uh, discipline cases, et cetera, where African-Americans uh, or Native Americans were identified in, in the records. And um, you, you heard uh, from a couple of the, the sources um, in the talk where I was looking specifically at, at records there, um, the, the Second Church of, of Kittery, Maine, um, and St. Paul's um, Church from um, Anglican Church in the colonial area were, were some of the records that I specifically examined when I, I researched at, at your library. Excellent. Uh, Laurel asks, for churches with Black or Native participants, were there any aspects of worship or church life from which they were excluded? Did you hear that question, Richard? Yeah, you, you cut out a little bit. Okay. The question, were there aspects which, uh, um, sorry. You, you want me to repeat it? Me. Um, yes, please. Sure, sorry about that. So sometimes, uh, thanks for bearing with us folks, sometimes the internet can be a, a little less than cooperative uh, as we um, broadcast our programs from various parts of the state and the country. So I'm gonna repeat that question. For churches with black or native participants, were there any aspects of worship or church life from which they were excluded? So yes, they're, they're certainly excluded from voting. Um, women were usually excluded from voting. Um, you had to be a church member, a full member to vote in churches. Women are usually excluded from voting in the 18th century in most churches. Um, African-American men then are, are the sort of, and Native American men are, are the only category of men excluded from voting um, during the 18th century. Uh, they're often having segregation. I mentioned that there's seating segregation and that seating segregation a lot of factors in the 18th century. Um, people are segregated by, by wealth or class and status, sometimes by gender. Um, but, but race is a pretty hard, fast dividing line in, in church seating as well. Sometimes when communion is offered, um, African-Americans have to wait until after all the white people have been served communion and then they come up separately. So that is one of the, the things that African-Americans complain about and, and argue that this is unchristian in the 19th century. And when those practices continue, um, of segregation in seating and segregation in access to sacraments, um, when those continue, then African-Americans and Native Americans are, are often saying, well, we don't need to be a part of this church. We can, we can have our own separate church. Leonard asks, uh, can you speak at all to, he mentions a Father Snowden and the Revere Street or now the Charles Street AME Church in Boston? Yeah, um, this is an important, uh, Snowden's Church is an important church in Boston. Um, it was, um, I believe, the church where David Walker uh, attended. And it was a church known for abolitionists and activists, African-Americans in Boston um, who were involved in anti-slavery movement, abolitionist movement, who were involved in fighting for 
um, integration of Boston schools and workplaces, they are often engaged in, in Snowden's Methodist Church. So the, the first church was the, the Baptist Church. Uh, I believe Snowden's church was the second church started in Boston. Um, by the antebellum period, there are, uh, I think, depends on the year, but, but two Methodist churches, two Black Methodist churches and two Black Baptist churches on Beacon Hill. Um, and there's some fascinating information about them on the Black Heritage Trail tour, um, which is a National Park Service tour in, in Boston. Um, certainly the Methodist tradition was important for David Walker and his uh, appeal and the ways that he went about critiquing um, other, how he went about critiquing white Christians. Jane is asking um, when there's when these individuals in, enslaved or otherwise that are that are listed as servants um, in a lot of your research, um, what are they typically using for last names? Do we know anything about their surnames? Yeah, there are, for the most part, uh, these servants, people who are identified as servants are, are really slaves and they are not given last names in, in public records, whether that's really any type of public record. Enslaved people are, are deprived of their identity, right? They're, they're renamed in many cases, and they're usually not given last names. The exception to that is Rhode Island. For some reason, and I don't really know what the reason is, enslaved people in 18th century Rhode Island are always identified with a last name in church records and other public records. It is usually the name of the person who owns them. Um, but it's just sort of something, something a little bit different about slavery in, in Rhode Island. And it's interesting, slavery can really vary from a city to a rural location, and slavery even varied from one northern colony or state to the other. Um, there's a big difference between slavery in New York and slavery in Connecticut, um, and, and so those are, or, or even Rhode Island. Um, a lot of times, if, if a person had a last name, and they're identified as servant. In some of those cases, I assume that, that they were actually a European indentured servant mm. um, in other contexts, and unless the names really indicated sort of African origins, where right? there's certain names that uh, are carried over uh, sort of African naming traditions, but there's also a lot of names that Europeans um, used to name enslaved people. Uh, you see lots of enslaved people named for towns like Boston, Salem, Newport, um, you see lots of enslaved people uh, named sort of almost comical names, right? Prince, um, Caesar, Cato, uh, et cetera. Zachary is asking, can you describe um, the difference between um, like native people, black people, low and lower class white people, um, I, I think one of the, his questions kind of wordy, but I'm trying to get to the meat of it. I, I, I wonder if what he's asking is, um, is there a difference in terms of race versus class, like in the hierarchy of society in the, in the period that we're talking about? Yeah, there's certainly, so it, it, it changes in the, in the 18th century, there's a whole constellation of factors. Class is one factor, race is one factor. But in the period before the American Revolution, everyone pretty much accepts that society is hierarchical. Mm -hmm. uh, they, especially before 1770, you know, we're lo they're loyal to the king and they're all subjects to the king. Uh, and that most everybody in society has someone who is above them and most people have someone who's below them. And so it's it's a mix of factors that decides one station. Um, there were there were poor white colonists who had some status associated with their piety, um, or you know their good name or their public service. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't just class. Um, after the American Revolution, in many ways, as slavery ends in the North, race becomes a more important dividing line, a more important status line. Um, as you start moving into the early United States and declaring in, in the founding documents, right, that all people are born free and equal or all men are born free and equal, uh, it become, and you start ending slavery, it becomes 
skin color becomes more important than status in many cases. And especially at the moment when Northern states end property requirements for voting is the same moment when they are excluding all African-Americans from voting. So again, Rhode Island is a little bit different, but most Northern states initially allowed voting based upon property holding. So at least in theory, property holding African-Americans were allowed to vote in, in Northern states. But during the democratic upheavals of the early 19th century, when you have a sort of Jacksonian democracy developing and now you have universal white male suffrage, the states are explicitly saying that black people cannot vote, whether they own property or not. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for sharing your, your time and your expertise with us this evening. Um, and thank you to our audience uh, for joining and for your thoughtful questions. The book is Dividing the Faith, The Rise of Segregated Churches in the Early American North. And that book is available through the Maine Historical Society Museum store at uh, myhistorystore.com. You can learn more about Maine Historical Society's programming, how to visit, if you're interested in doing research in our library, uh, the same way that Richard did, and you'd like to make an appointment, uh, or you'd like to learn how to become a member, or see the recording of this program and other programs, visit our website, mainhistory.org. If you're interested in doing research of your own from home, using Maine Historical Society's collections and looking into collections from across the state, be sure to visit our online database, Main Memory Network at mainmemory.net. Uh, thank you again, uh, Richard. Is there anything else that you, you'd like to say before we close this evening? Um, no, I, I appreciate this opportunity to, to share. And um, there's a lot more in the book if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to reading it. And uh, the pleasure was ours. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in.